January 7, 2010. Two chemistry graduate students at Texas Tech University are synthesizing and studying a highly volatile explosive compound. In a matter of less than one minute, while stirring a mixture of the compound and hexane, an explosion occurs, leaving one of the students with life-changing injuries. Welcome to Fox Files, I'm Stoneware Fox, and today I'm going to go over the Texas Tech lab incident. So before we begin, I'd like to sort out what you just heard in the intro, and I also want to, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for the overwhelming support on my last two videos. Both of them blew up way beyond what I expected, and I love every single one of you for contributing to that. Um, but reflecting on all of these views and what I want this channel to be about, I've come across a variety of interesting topics, ranging from true crime to scientific mishaps and even some folk legends here and there, which is why I've decided to lean into the less evil Agent Smith persona for the channel and do a sort of case report on things that I find interesting. And in doing so, I came up with a series I'd like to call Fox Files, where I conduct these investigations on those interesting events or topics. But if we're gonna go over an event that involves science, I'm gonna need some help. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Fox, the arguably smarter Fox brother, and I'll be explaining the scientific side of the Fox Files, something that Agent Fox refuses to do because he thinks science is for nerds, but in reality, he just can't be bothered to learn something new and actually use his brain okay, for that's, once. that's enough. Stop. So yeah, as Dr. Dweeb here just said, he'll be handling the science of the case when he's needed, uh, and I'll be handling the overall case file. So without further ado, let's begin with this case and put my name even further up the government watch list for researching explosive chemicals on the internet. So as you heard in the intro on January 7th of 2010, the critical mishandling of a chemical led to it exploding and injuring the student handling it. But what really happened and why did the chemical explode? Well, for starters, the name of the chemical is nickel hydrazine perchlorate, a lavender colored powder that, as you might have guessed, really likes to explode. And it just so happened that the grad students were making a lot of it. For reference, the guidelines for nickel hydrazine perchlorate, which from now I'll call NHP, were to limit the amount handled at any time to 100 milligrams. This is a bit more than a pinch if you really think about it. The students in this lab decided to make 10 grams of this stuff, which for reference looks like this, about two and a half teaspoons, right? And for YouTube, this is flour, by the way, uh, which means they were working with literally 100 times the material that they were supposed to. And the way the accident happened was that the students were trying to break some larger pieces of the compound into smaller grains. But because you really don't want to touch this while it's dry, they mixed it with hexane. And the reason why they did this is because they noticed that in previous experiments, smaller amounts of NHP would actually be safer if they were wet with hexane or water. So assuming that it worked with small amounts, they thought a large amount would also be stable when wet completely ignoring the fact that hexane is a flammable liquid. So taking about half of the NHP they made and mixing it with the hexane, the most senior student, who was a PhD student, uh, he tried to break apart those pieces with a mortar and pestle. After doing this, he walked away for a bit before coming back to the mixture one last time. As he disturbed it again, the mixture immediately detonated and the student lost three of his fingers and because he had taken his goggles off, the explosion also damaged his eyes. But before we break down the rest of the case, I'm gonna let Dr. Fox here take care of the science. Basically what we have to start off with is this very cursed compound called nickel hydrazine. It's one nickel atom bonded to five hydrazines, around there as you can see, eventually bonding to two perchlorates to make nickel hydrazine perchlorate. And for any chem experts, please bear with me, there were no images of nickel hydrazine specifically in this arrangement with five hydrazines so i apologize anyway this compound is related to nickel hydrazine nitrate which to start off with only has three hydrazines and instead of the perchlorate has two nitrates and as you might have guessed this thing containing two nitrates instead of two perchlorates makes it a lot more stable and way less violent so yeah this one right here this is okay right this one this is not okay. 
This is what we want to avoid making 10 grams of. But the reason why is a bit more obscure. And as you might have guessed, it has to do with this one having nitrate and this one having perchlorate, which actually makes more of a difference than you might think. And for that, we have to look at something called the reduction potential. And this is really just the measure of how badly something wants to lose electrons. The unit for this is going to be volts. As you can see here, volts is a measure of electric potential. The less electric potential, the less you want to lose electrons, but the more electron potential, the more you want to lose them. And basically, the higher the reduction potential, the more a chemical wants to react. Hurry up, you're boring them. Shut up. Anyway, the reduction potential of a nitrate ion to be reduced to a nitrite ion is 420 millivolts, which is 0.42 volts. But on the other hand, the reduction potential for a perchlorate ion to be reduced to a chlorate ion is 1.2 volts. So yeah, pretty much three times the potential to be reduced. And conveniently, as a nitrate ion and especially a perchlorate ion are reduced, an exothermic reaction happens. And if you have a lot of those, you get an explosion. And if you remember, the grad student in question not only detonated five grams of NHP, but he also mixed it with hexane, which as Agent Fox said, is a flammable liquid, which probably didn't help his case. There, done, you happy? Nerd. So as you can see, you take a volatile compound and mishandle it, and you end up with a really bad time. But what about safety measures, right? Surely this lab had trained its students and told them that what they were making was a literal bomb. But before we answer that question, let me, let me tell you why they were making NHP in the first place. In 2008, Texas Tech entered a program called ALERT, which stands for Awareness and Localization of Explosive Related Threats. For Texas Tech, their job was to study and characterize potentially explosive materials that could be a risk to society. And this ALERT program was and is still funded by the US Department of Homeland Security. And for the record, I knew it. The government was behind this all along, and this program began in 2008 before the presidential election, which means even though the accident happened in 2010, George Bush was still president when the program was started, and he's behind <laughs> So after joining the program, which was overseen by Northeastern University, Texas Tech would have had to implement a quite large number of approved procedures and regulations regarding their experiments. Again, seeing as they were working with extremely volatile chemicals, you would assume that the university would inform the chemistry department of the necessary guidelines. This would eventually trickle down so that the department communicates those guidelines to the lab faculty and then to whoever is doing the experiment. But in this case, absolutely none of that happened. According to the case report that I've been going off of for this, the chemistry labs in question were not informed of the potential dangers that making NHP can expose someone to. They didn't have a blast shield. They didn't have safety training for students working with the chemicals. And faculty sure as hell didn't double check the individual scientific procedures that the students were carrying out. And it came to the point where the investigation found that not only was the injured student not taking proper notes on any of the experiments, most of the chemical containers around the lab were mislabeled, misplaced, stored improperly, and in the dude's pockets. Yeah, according to an article by Chemical and Engineering News, investigation found that the student in question was accidentally taking home materials from the lab in largely unlabeled vials, which were then seized and destroyed by bomb squads. And, oh, the ATF was also involved for some reason, which, as far as I'm concerned, dogs aren't allowed in chem labs. But, you know, I guess the ATF was there. What's that? Oh, bomb. Oh, I thought you said Rottweiler. Even more investigation found that the student was falling short of just about every rule he should have been following when handling explosive chemicals. So, aside from not labeling vials at all, here's a surely incomplete list of questionable practices in that lab. He gradually increased the production of NHP batches from the 100 milligrams, making then 1 gram batches, then 3 gram batches, then 5 gram, until the absolutely ungodly 10 gram batch. He also did not report to his chemical engineering professor that he was increasing the batch amount of NHP. 
He stored various chemicals in glass vials despite being told that metal was a way better material to store it. He took awful notes in his lab notebook for what they were doing on any given day. And lastly, he said that he and the other student were making a completely different compound called cobalt perchlorate hydrazinate, which isn't even the correct name of the compound he was referring to. Yeah, who's the nerd now? So as you can see, all of this makes it pretty much certain that an accident was waiting to happen in that lab. And to make it all worse, he had to suffer a life-changing injury because of it. Now, I realize that it might seem like I'm making jokes at his expense, which I'm not, but a lot of what happened could have been so easily avoided had he not been playing around. I mean, he made 10 entire grams of a compound that blows up if you look at it funny and massaged it afterwards. But despite that, I do have a certain degree of empathy for him because the chemistry department completely neglected to give them proper safety training, uh, not to mention the right equipment to be safely characterizing gunpowder on steroids. Overall, there were many mistakes made by several parties of the chain of command, but again, he knew what he was working with and improper lab procedures resulted in the accident. But what isn't an accident is you watching this video in its entirety, which I very much appreciate. I hope you enjoy the video and the format, and as always, I am very open to feedback about the whole channel dynamic. I'm still figuring out how to make myself stand out on the platform, and any suggestions are, of course, always welcome. With that, thank you for tuning in. Like, comment, and subscribe if you want. And I, we, we will see you next time. That's it. Yeah. You done?